Well, good morning. We are in Mark chapter 7. You know, one of the things I, I love about the, the show The Chosen is just the way that it, it brings out the humanity of Jesus. It brings out his sense of humor. It brings out his interaction with the disciples and with the people. And you know, a lot of times when, well, not a lot of times, pretty much any time we read Scripture, we bring our own preconceived ideas and perceptions. And one of the places that's often hard for us is to see Jesus' sense of humor and some of the subtleties. And so this morning's passage is one that honestly bothers a lot of people. Honestly, it bothered me until I really understood it. And so as we read this, as we look at this morning's passage, I want to just challenge you to allow yourself to imagine Jesus in the light that I'm going to present him in. Uh, and I think it will make, a whole, make sense out of a story that oftentimes doesn't seem to make sense, at least at first. But the context that we're in here is, remember Mark chapter 7, Jesus has this confrontation with the Pharisees. He's been traveling around in Galilee, and pretty much everywhere he turns, the Pharisees are there waiting for him, and they are accusing him of being this renegade rabbi, and that he doesn't keep the traditions, which he doesn't, and makes no bones about. And so, when we get to this section in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24... Jesus is needing a break. He's needing to get out of the chaos. He's needing a time to just rest and recover a little bit. He knows his disciples need it as well. And so let's look at verse 24 as it sets the context. It says, Jesus left that pit place, meaning this in the, kind of the edge of Galilee, and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, Yet he could not keep his presence secret. So as often happens, as Jesus often does in the Gospels, he's trying to get away, to rest, to commune with his Father, to teach his disciples more intimately. And yet, even here, he doesn't get away. But we need to remember the context there, here. The Pharisees, remember they say that purity is a matter of washing hands eating the right foods, avoiding contact with unclean people such as lepers, sinners, and of course Gentiles. Jesus, on the other hand, says purity is a matter of the heart and that the Pharisaic laws of purity are chains and shackles that replace God's law with human tradition. <coughs> and so Jesus, in order to emphasize his point, does a very shocking thing, especially to the Pharisees. He leaves the land of the Jews and journeys to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, what you need to understand here, this isn't just like going to Topeka, or this isn't just like going to Wichita or Kansas City. It's not just the distance, it's also the very location. Tyre was considered one of the most unclean regions in the eyes of the Jews. Josephus, a Jewish historian, describes the inhabitants of Tyre as, quote, notoriously our bitterest enemies. Remember Jezebel, most wicked woman to ever have power of Israel, was the daughter of, guess who? The king of Tyre who gave her to Ahab in marriage. Jezebel brought her pagan gods into Israel. So question, why does Jesus go to Tyre when it is such a pagan place? Well, remember what he says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17? He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. I think he also went there because he just flat out needed a break from the Pharisees. And where, what better place to go than some place he knew they would have nothing to do with. So let's read verse 24 and move on to 25 as well. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. 
He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Okay, remember the context here. Jesus and the disciples are tired. They had just left a major conflict with the religious authorities. And immediately before their conflict, they had their last attempt to get away, foiled when the crowd ran around the sea and waited for them. So remember back in 631, Jesus said, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest. Yet when they got to the other side, what did they find? A huge crowd ran ahead of them. 5,000 plus men, probably 15,000 people, was waiting for them on the other side of the Sea of Galilee when they were going to get a retreat, going to get away. Right before that, part of why Jesus wanted them to get away is they just heard about the gruesome death of John the Baptist. Jesus' cousin, and many of the disciples' first rabbi. So now they escape to Tyre, and guess what? Even in the region of Tyre, a needy person shows up wanting something from Jesus. Again, look at verse 25. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Even in Tyre, he can't get away. But now I want you to think about this woman for a minute. Because this is a woman with what I say has three very big strikes against her right from the beginning. First of all, look at verse 26. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Okay, strike number one, she was a Gentile. She was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She's another Jezebel. Or at least that's how most of the Jews of Jesus' day would have seen her. In fact, do you know what the favorite term the Jews would use for Gentiles was? Dog. And you have to understand, in Jesus' day... Very, very, very few people had dogs as pets. In fact, when they referred to dogs, they would refer to much more like we would coyotes on the edge of the village or wild dogs that were scavengers amongst eat the trash, etc. So much so that this is how the Jews describe Gentiles. Quote, As the sacred food was intended for men, but not for the dogs, the Torah was intended to be given to the chosen people, but not to the Gentiles. So they wouldn't even read Scripture to a Gentile because a Gentile wasn't worthy of it. Or hear this one. An Israelite may not aid a Gentile woman in childbirth since she would be assisting to bring forth a child of idolatry. So if you came along the side of the road and found a woman in labor as a good, as a quote, good Jew, you were just supposed to leave her alone. Because after all, if you saved her and the baby, that would just be one more Gentile in the world. That's how big this strike is to begin with. But the second strike that she has against her was she was a woman. And ladies, please don't be offended at me. I'm just the messenger of how things work. In Jesus' day, even more so than our day, and we still have remnants of it in our day, I don't agree with that either, women were looked down, with great, looked down upon with great contempt. For example, there's this really strange passage in the Gospel of Thomas, which is an apocryphal book uh, written somewhere sh- shortly after Jesus' time. The Gospel of Thomas says this, Simon Peter said to them, Let Mary go away from us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, Lo, I shall lead her so that I may make her male, that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And folks, this is long before our transgender stuff that we wrestle with today. Okay, that was the contempt they had towards women. Other writings of the day said things like this. Only men are worthy to be educated. Let your house be a meeting place for the sages and sit amongst their feet and thirstily drink in their words. But he that talks much with women brings evil upon himself and neglects the study of the law and in the end will occupy a place in hell. One of their most famous teachers, Rabbi Hillel, said this. He said, For from the garment issueth the moth, and from a woman a woman's wickedness. Better is the wickedness of a man than the goodness of a woman. If you think misogyny is bad today, it was even worse in Jesus' day. So, she's a Gentile, she's a woman, and her third strike against her is she's an intruder. I mean, think about it. Jesus is attempting to hide from the crowds. He's getting away from some rest. Think about what it's like for you if you've been run ragged and you're tired and someone shows up needing something from you. And yet, notice, and so let's notice Jesus' response to her request. Verse 27. He says, first let the children all they eat, eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to give the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Hmm. That doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? Is he responding the way a typical Jewish male of his day would respond to a woman from Syria and Phoenicia? Is he responding how I might respond if a needy person interrupted my long-waited day off? Is he testing her determination and faith? Is he testing his disciples to see if they've learned anything from the conflicts with the Pharisees? Well, let's read Matthew's account of this, part of Matthew's account of this story. Matthew 15, 21 through 24. It says, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel? Notice in Matthew's account, it goes even further. Jesus appears to be ignoring the woman. Notice the disciples, in their typical clueless selves, Ask Jesus to send her away. But notice especially Jesus' answer to their request. Verse 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, wait a second. Does that make sense from what we've seen in Jesus' story? I mean, what about the Samaritan woman in John 4? What about the centurion in Matthew 8? What about you and me? I don't, I don't know everybody's lineage, but I'm certainly not Jewish. Okay? If Jesus was sent only for the lost sheep in Israel, of Israel, what in the world are we doing here today? I believe the key to understanding Jesus' strange words is the ability to see the, quote, twinkle in his eye. Go back to Mark. Look at Mark 7, 27 again. He says, First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, earlier I mentioned to you that one of the favorite words, favorite um, uh, insults, that Jews would use about Gentile was 
the term dog. Well, guess what, folks? The word translated here by the NIV as their dogs is not the same word the Jews used frequently to insult Gentiles with. They used a word that, that spoke of the scavenger dog. Jesus uses the diminutive, the enduring word for dog that speaks of the rare exception, the small dogs that some people allowed in their house as pets. It could even be, it might possibly be better to translate it as doggies. Oh, the disciples definitely heard the word dog, made that connection. But I believe because of the look in his eye, because of his nonverbal communication to the woman, she understood him in the sense of doggies. When Jesus tells the woman that it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs, I see a smile, maybe even a wink between Jesus and the woman. There is a twinkle in his eye that told the woman that he was asking her to play along. In fact, I think what Jesus does is he speaks what he knows his disciples are thinking. I mean, have you ever heard, had an ugly thought in your head and somebody else spoke it out loud? And then you see just how ugly that thought really is? I think that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus speaks what he knows the disciples are thinking. Jesus speaks their prejudice and their attitude of self-righteousness, but he does it in such a way that the woman knows exactly what he's doing, because look at her reply. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. I love it. Yes, Lord, but even the crumbs which fall from your table would be sufficient for me. Do you see her faith? Do you see her humility? I mean, for you and I as white American people, we've, we've probably not experienced the kind of discrimination from the other side of the coin. We've not been in this kind of place before. Or at least not very likely. And yet, here she is, amongst men who all but Jesus were looking down upon her, were despising her because she was a woman, because she was a Gentile, because she was interrupting them. And yet, she picked up something from Jesus, and she had the humility to ignore the disdain that she was getting from the disciples, to ignore their prejudice and to play along and to say, Jesus, if all you got for me is a crumb, I'll take one of your crumbs any day of the week. She comes to Jesus knowing that she has nothing to offer him. She comes knowing that she deserves nothing, but she asks for everything. She asks, can you heal my daughter? What faith, what humility, what love. She says, yes, Lord, but even the crumbs which fall from your table would be sufficient for me. And look at Jesus' response, verse 29. Then he told her, for such a re reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Do you see the smile on Jesus' face? Do you see the joy in his heart? 
Do you see Jesus thinking to himself, wow, what a woman. Her daughter has a demon and yet she can smile. She can still play along. She can still have a godly sense of humor. She can still join me in teaching my disciples about the ugliness of prejudice. About the ugliness of self-righteousness. And of my compassion for all people. So look at the results, verse 30. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful story if you allow yourself to get into it and to see Jesus with that twinkle in his eye playing along with a woman who is desperate for her daughter to be healed. Well, that's the story. What does it say to you and me? Well, the first application I want us to see from this is I want us to see that we must not take our election exclusively. You see, the Jews thought they had a corner on God's favor. They thought their privileged place with God was due to something they had done, and therefore others were excluded. I wish I could say that that does not continue to exist today. That temptation still faces you and me and every religious person around. That's really at the core of most prejudice. It's the core of so many struggles because we think that unless you look like me, think like me, talk like me, worship like me, then you're not accepted by God like me. You know, God's God's got a much bigger umbrella. God doesn't see people like you and I see people. And I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful because there's a lot of people that would look at me and go see all the different ways that I don't match them and find ways to exclude me. And yet God's reality is that He chooses all of us. You know, Israel, one of Israel's biggest problems was they always thought that God chose Israel because they were somehow better than everyone else. You know, that he chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because somehow Abraham was a more holy person than the others in his day. I'm not buying that anymore. Abraham was a fallen, broken individual. I mean, he lied about his wife, Sarah, not once, but twice. Even after God promised him, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. He says, no, she's not my wife. She's my sister because I'm scared you're going to take me. Over and over in the Old Testament, the prophets speak to Israel and say, God did not choose you because you were better than others. He chose you because He chose you. And in fact, I I contend that most of the individuals and the nation of Israel, God, I think, sort of chose out of a way of saying, oh yeah, watch this. (laughs) If I can do good things with someone like a Samson, if I can do good things with a Gideon who's a coward, You know, we just walked through Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith, and every single person listed there has huge flaws in their story. And yet, so much of the time, we get it in our heads that God has chosen us because we are somehow better than others. The reality is anything but that. Yes, I believe God's chosen you and me. 
but it had absolutely nothing to do with our worthiness to be chosen, but just the nature of who God is. And so just think of the arrogance that we have whenever we start looking down our spiritual noses at anyone else. Because they don't have the same accent we do. Maybe they don't even speak our language. Maybe their skin color is different. Maybe they worship differently than we do. And, and folks, this happens on all ends of the spectrum when it comes to denominations, when it comes to worship styles, when it comes, it's like it's just ingrained within us, ingrained within our flesh that we think the way we do it is right and therefore the way others do it is wrong and so therefore we see ourselves as better than. The real irony though, and I don't want to get sidetracked too much, the real irony of this better than thinking is it's always a cover-up of shame. It's always that gnawing belief inside of me that I am not good enough, I am not worthy, I am not able. And so therefore I look at someone else and I see their flaws and I focus on that as a way of trying to make myself feel better about my own flaws. The reality is we are all fallen, we are all broken. And it's only God's grace that allows any human being to be acceptable to Him. So don't take your election exclusively. Then second, don't take your requests pridefully. You know, we are called to bring all our cares, cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. We are called to come boldly into His throne of grace. But sometimes we bring our requests to God, only they're not requests, they are demands. And we must never forget that we're not entitled to demand anything of Jesus. Deliverance is not a right for us to claim. Deliverance is not a reward for us on earth. Deliverance is not a paycheck for a job well done. Deliverance and any other gift from God is always just that. It is a gift to be received. Yes, we are to go to God boldly, but also humbly. We are go to God like, you know, from this woman, just her attitude of humility that was Jesus, can you please heal my daughter? Well, is it right to give the food to the intended for the children to the dogs? Jesus, I'll take a crumb. He calls us to that same kind of humility. To be able to go to God and say, God, if in your mercy you can find a way to whatever I'm asking of, it's a recognition of His sovereignty and a recognition that He knows what's best and that He is a good, good Father. But that we still come to Him in humbleness rather than pride. But then the third application I want us to see here is don't take your justification lightly. Jesus told the woman that, her de that the demon had left her daughter. And what did she do? She ran home to find her daughter sane and in her right mind. She didn't say, Jesus, you got to come with me. Jesus said it, she believed it, she went home and she found confirmation of that. And folks, you and I need to learn to do the same thing. And where we need to learn that, I think, the most is in the place of hearing who Jesus say we are 
and then living it out. You know, one of the things that got from pure desire, they think they got, I think they got it from Neil T. Anderson, is this long list of I statements. Who, I, who am I in Christ? You know, I'm beloved. I'm, uh, you know, I, they're just like, I think it's 80 or more um, positive assertions of, what scripture, of who Scripture says we are. Who Scripture says I am. And we have our history, we have the enemy, we have the world, we have everything around us trying to tell us a different message of who we are. And what you and I need to do more than anything else in this regard is to keep going back to Jesus and asking him who, what his truth is about you and me. We all have scripts that we heard early in childhood or we, our mind grabbed hold of because of the brokenness we experienced. And yet the reality is, Jesus says something very different about who we are. We are enough. We are holy. We are forgiven. We are righteous. Not because we've accomplished it, but because Jesus has done it for us. There's a story told from Napoleon's day. It's a story of a private one day. Napoleon was there and his horse escaped. And without even thinking, a private jumped on his horse and took off after it, and he caught Napoleon's prized stallion. And he brought it back to Napoleon. And Napoleon looked at him and said, Thank you, Captain. And the private said, Thank you, sir. Went to his barracks grabbed all his clothes, all his stuff, and immediately moved into the officer's quarters. Went and got officer's clothing that had captain's bars on it. Why? Because Napoleon said he was a captain, so therefore he was a captain. And the same thing is true for you and me. Because what does Jesus say about you and what about me? He says, you're forgiven. You're my son. You're my daughter. You are royalty in the kingdom. You are. I am. We are. So let's put on the clothes of righteousness that match who he says we are and live in that reality. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we just thank you for this sweet story. And we thank you, Lord, for the ways that you work in our lives. And we confess, Lord, that it's so easy for us to look down on people because they sin differently than we do or because they worship differently than we do or whatever is different about them and to treat people with contempt like the disciples did this woman. And yet, Lord, we know that is not your heart. That's not who you are. So we ask that you give us your heart. And we ask, Lord, that you give us the courage to come to you boldly with any request that we have but also, Lord, with humility, knowing that we are beggars and you are the king. But also, Lord, knowing that you are a king who loves us more than we could ever fathom. And so we can come to you boldly, but we still need to recognize that our requests have to be made in the humility that knows that even when you say no to our requests, it's not because you're withholding, 
it's because you, you know what's best and you are working the long game. And then finally, Lord, I ask that you help us to really grab hold of who we are in you. As the woman left Jesus to go home and find her daughter healed, trusting that Jesus had done what he said he would do, I pray that you be with each one of us as we leave today, that we would go home trusting that you have indeed done what you said you have done. And you have transformed us from darkness to light and that you have made us yours and you've made us holy and you have made us who you say you have made us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we leave here today, let me just encourage you. Grab hold of that truth of who Jesus says you are. And if you're not sure that you've heard that yet, ask him. Spend time asking him, Jesus, who am I to you? And you may be shocked at what he tells you. And with that, we are dismissed.